astonishing passage that told about how Yeats kind of discovered passion and, and the body because he had buried himself in sand and it kind of awakened things. So I was just astounded by this and, and wrote a poem. So anyway. Poets are strange. Anyway. Yeats in love. Inside by mid-morning she suffers from the soul. She can't sit still. She's underfoot or in her mother's hair or breaking things she loves. Frail emissaries sent to bear their loves, once precious things from leaden in her hands, dumb hands that have forgotten all they've known of the gestures of cherishing. The cheap guitar, impossible to tune, apple-cheeked dolls bought with books of green stamp saved, the music box her uncle made that played the song she'd heard her mother sing so many times it still slowed her breath. The filaments of song, a golden rope that night after night lowered her to sleep. Now, night, she lies wakeful in the silence of spring peepers and cricket calls, turning the questions over in her mind. How will it ever come to her, her life? How find her here, in the middle of nowhere, where she's always been? Nothing but cows, sky, cow manure, and corn. And that other, worldless, wordless question, its urgent, constant pressure pressed against the length of her, so that her mind and muscles ached. She could keep her bed no more than could the adolescent Yates. She liked to think of him becoming conscious of desire as his body stirred against the weight of sand he buried himself in. Outside, drowsing in sun, sometimes she dreams of bare arms flashing through waves of corn, of trees close grown together sheltering her, of hands that trail along the smooth, moist walls of caves, the body following blind as bats or moles, and just that much at home in corridors of dark. Or else she lies face hidden in the cool declivities of hills, a remedy that only feeds the shame she'd hoped to check. She knows herself possessed. Desire belongs to the other one who's come to live inside her for a while the one that she will nourish, giving all that she can spare from her own life, much more than she can spare. Austerity's angel, eunuch for the blessed kingdom of her heart. When Yeats first met Maud Gaughan, it was as if, like Venus rising from the waves, she stepped forth from his own body, more beautiful and larger than he was, more passionate. He'd given her his life, now she was free to move toward him across a crowded room, to touch her hands to his and bring to life that ancient wholeness first desire cleaves, and free to turn, redoubling the pain that time and discipline has, has somewhat eased. Phoenix, daughter of Leda, Amazon, my wall is loosening, O oh honeybees, come build in the empty house. to the uh, Louisville Slugger Museum today. My friend Derek Mung and I brought this back for you. So, piece of wood. This piece of wood is apparently on the barrel, the end of a barrel of a bat before they cut it off, and I'm not sure why they put it there to begin with, but uh, they give it to you at the end of the tour. Um, so, I'm going to read this baseball poem. I'm a big baseball fan. I grew up in Cleveland, unfortunately. And, uh, <laughs> Um, so as you, if you know anything about the Indians, you know that they're a constant uh, factory of suffering. And um, let's see, back in 2005, they came very close to winning the Central Division and lost in the, like, the last three games of the season. They blew the lead and didn't make the playoffs. The following year, they were supposed to be really good and ended up, I think, being in fourth place. They were terrible. Uh, but they used to have this guy named Casey Blake, who now plays for um, the Dodgers. And uh, at the beginning of 2006, he was he was hitting amazingly, and the year before he was terrible. And if anyone that follows baseball knows that, like it seems to mimic, you know, the, the 
say, the rhythms of the heart, the rhythms of life. One year, you're doing terrible. The next year, you're doing amazing. One month, you're hitting 500. The next month, you're hitting 180. And uh, at the time, I was living in Missouri and going through a lot of these emotional swings myself, and I was thinking of a lot of baseball metaphors to, to describe these swings that I was going through. Um, so I was thinking a lot about Casey Blake <laughs> and the nature of time as I followed this 2006 season. So the poem is called Casey Blake and Time. When you came back, Casey was tearing up the league in April. What a difference a year makes, Rick Manning would say. Last fall, he couldn't hit Dick with ducks on the pond, but this spring, dicks, ducks, all go down quietly. <laughs> I was thinking I could be up for comeback player of the year. My on-base plus slugging percentage was making waves in fantasy leagues across the eastern seaboard. But I knew I couldn't think about it, chewing myself into a slump. So I went on kissing you in a see-the-ball-hit-the-ball kind of approach. Casey magically did the same. And for a while, all was in alignment. The tribe, the stars, my love life. We drove to Kansas City to see Casey in person, whose identity you'd assumed on MySpace to hide yourself from your psycho ex-boyfriend. And the tribe got pounded. John Buck of the zero home runs and sub-200 batting average hit two three-run homers off Cliff Lee, the second giving the Royals the lead and their 12th hit, sending the few fans there into a frenzy. Not because of the lead, but because a dozen hits meant a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts free for every fan courtesy of the organization. I thought I'd stepped into a Kansas City apocalypse. Fathers holding up sons triumphantly, daughters hugging complete strangers, mothers pulling off their George Brett jerseys as if Axl Rose himself were jogging in from the bullpen. And I turned to look at you and saw a war between cheerfulness and regret on your face as if you knew then that something about us was like trying to jam a puzzle piece into the wrong place. We stopped at the American Inn on the way back, shaking off the loss with some all-American motel sex, and as you slept, I listened to the semis sighing by on the freeway, thinking, I'm in a Tom Waits song, smiling and pulling my happiness around you, listening to the soft sounds you made in your sleep. Soon enough, thinking about the Indians again, how badly they played, wondering why can they not just match my catapulted psyche. Even in complete happiness, there is a chip. Even in the hottest streak, the seeds of a slump. Casey went on hitting through May. His power numbers jumped from two home runs to nine. But in that surge bloomed a tendency to overswing, as in June he dropped to 194 with one home run and then got hurt. By then, I was puttering around my apartment thinking, Today I'm sending in my designated hitter. He will swing for me. I will be in the dugout. It was not so long before, but an eternity, that I'd been a different person. When we drove home from Kansas City and I shook hands with all the things I grew to resent in your absence, the telephone lines and billboards, the fast food facades, when I saw the summer spread out before us like a fresh blue page of architectural plans, making it impossible to think of the loss the night before as anything but a wrinkle in the season's larger design for us, and I took your hand in silence for assent. Impossible to tell in the day-to-day -day what the numbers would tell 